you know, starting up a new brand, becoming a living god. I don't know if that's taken or not. Yeah, I'm not sure if it is, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> we are recording, but I'll keep that in. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so welcome to Talk Gnosis. We've got uh, one of our classic Q&A shows. Really, our guests today are you, the audience. But uh, coming to the show for the first time to help us answer these questions are Bishop Tim Mansfield and Nick Lachetti. Hello, Bishop Tim. Hello, guys. Hey. Uh, welcome to Talk Gnosis. Been wanting to have you folks on for a really long time, so it's a real pleasure, a real honor. But all jokes aside, I, I think uh, we're going to hear some, some really interesting uh, answers to, the, to today's questions. Where I think we're going to have some uh, a variety of perspectives, and it's all going to be really awesome. And that's why you should give us money, listener or watcher. <laughs> Patreon.com <laughs> slash Gnostic. For as little as a dollar per piece of media per month, you can actually cap it. You can just give us a buck. Just, just give us a buck. Uh, there's about 3,000 of you, um, and I know these are hard times, but about 0. 0.0001 uh, the donate. That's okay. I know that you all can't. And actually, the majority of patrons are uh, past guests and, and friends. But uh, uh, you help us uh, uh, keep the show going. And if you can't help us out financially, again, as we said, uh, we completely understand. Just tell people about the show. Share it. We're on YouTube. We are on every podcasting uh, network or podcatcher. So also like, subscribe, and share because that's uh, unfortunately vital. And, and I wish it wasn't. You know, I wish I didn't have to do this at the beginning of the show. But uh, we live in an iconic world, which is kind of the point of the show. You can also do one-time donations at paypal.me slash Gnostic. And, you know, I, I've been thinking, actually, uh, Jason, maybe I'll start having, like, people I owe money to come on and do the Patreon ad. Like, my landlord can come on. I can get somebody from the student loans. Maybe they can come on. I had a very nice call from the Canada Revenue Agency. Maybe they would join the call. Okay, yeah. yeah. Actually, actually, I do. They, they, they are also in the uh, I'm also in the red to them. So, yeah, yeah. they can come on for both of us. Um, they've, got, um, they've got hot dog fingers, right? Yes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, uh, a, a great question that, that I think in roundabout ways we, we have actually answered on the show a lot, in some ways almost every episode, but, but it's really nice to tease these things out, make it explicit, and of course hear what, what some of the different perspectives are, because for every answer you're always going to hear, well, yes and no, or yes and, and it's kind of like this, and it's also this, and it's this thing, and the other thing, so. Ben 8 wants to know, I'm always fascinated by hermeneutics, by how things are interpreted, how literally and how symbolically, for instance, resurrection. What does it mean for Jesus to rise from the dead? What were some of the different ways of understanding this? And the, he put that in the past tense, but let's bring that into the present tense as well. Who, who wants to start with that one? Nick, mm. go. Oh, wait. <laughs> Tim, go. Tim. If Nick, if Nick's got to, Nick, if you've got to take, you go. But I, I think I, I was being volunteered. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, let me see. Um, I mean, the resurrection stories in the Gospels are generally understood to be fairly late, like not written anywhere close, like you know, two or three generations after the direct disciples of Jesus um, who were actually present, which means and most scripture in most religions begins as oral tradition and winds up being written down when people can't rely on each other to re reproduce the oral tradition accurately, right? <clears throat> Writing wasn't common. Most people couldn't read. So um, scripture is best thought of as record keeping uh, because it's not you know, in, it, in our in rights pretty much. Um, but that was not the case in the in the first second third century right most people didn't write you had to hire a scribe it was expensive and so you've got to kind of have that in mind um what that indicates is so the a sort of beware that you should be keeping in mind when thinking about anything in scripture is um you're dealing with gossip <laughs> with the mechanics of gossip with the way um or the telephone game if you if you want to figure it that way um so um, I think when you read things that sound like they're kind of unbelievable, you should treat those things with significant skepticism um, and, and a human being rising from the dead in their physical body and wandering around um, is, is a difficult to believe thing. 
I, who knows, maybe such things do occur, but it seems unlikely. So we led to a, I think we're led to that by a, led by that to a symbolic interpretation of the story that we, we're being told. The other thing I think to bear in mind is that you see these cycles of interpretation happen in, particularly in Christian religious tradition. I'm not going to talk about anybody else, but in Christian religious tradition, things which are mystical and symbolic experiences at a certain point, then a certain cultural civilization falls or um, things get moved from a literate, you know, stories move from a literate urban civilization to a pack of farmers in the middle of England, um, you know, who can barely know where their heads are. Um, I get to say that because my heritage is English, so it's not racist. Um, uh, <laughs> Could, could be why I picked it. Also, you know, <laughs> Saxon history has done some of the greatest damage next to Roman history on the Christian tradition. So, you know, I get to sort of observe that as well. Um, <laughs> so interpretations of things go from symbolic to um, superstitious and physical sort of over and over again over the last 2000 years. And so that's worth bearing in mind. So let's just bracket out Jesus rising from the dead as a physical thing. Um, two interpretations that I'm fond of. One is just, uh, this is kind of commonplace in esoteric Christianity is to just observe the sheer number of things in the resurrection stories that Jesus does that aren't physical body things. Um, the disciples are on a boat and then Jesus is on a boat and there's no story, uh, sorry, there's a, there's a clearly obvious redacted, you know, redaction moment where someone says, by walking across the water, because people were clearly misunderstanding how he got on the boat. But the earlier version of the text, Leviticon version, for instance, which poses itself as an earlier version of the John text, as Jesus just appearing on the boat. There's no explanation of how he got there, which is more plausible. He appears inside locked rooms without anybody opening doors. People put their hands into the side of his body. Um, you know, all kinds of things occur, which aren't really physical body things. So uh, Cynthia Bourgeau points to this. That, that was my kind of first encounter with that, with someone pointing that out. Um, but it's a classic in, in esoteric Christianity that the post-resurrection body is not a physical body. It's, a, it's, it's people having visions of Jesus. Um, so he dies and then people have visions. And so people continue to have an encounter with a, a mystical visionary version of Jesus after he's dead. That's one. Second one, um, <laughs> hang on a second, I've got to change my glasses, Barker goggles. There we go. Um, <laughs> with the Barker goggles on, so uh, Margaret Barker, Temple Theology Perspective, um, just to observe that the in Greek um, anastasis means really means to stand back up. It, it can mean to to resurrect in the sense that we mean it, but possibly only because it kept getting used to refer to what happened to Jesus. Um, the the high priest sits down on the throne of the holy of holies, and when he stands back up, he has become God. Right. So to resurrect. <laughs> <laughs> To resurrect, to come, to come to life, perhaps, um, is, the, is the process of divinization, the process of union with the divine. Um, and that's the future to which all, all human beings are ultimately called, is to, is to engage in the work, to um, enter into, into spiritual practice and to come into union with God. Um, and so that's a different way of what rising to life is meant to mean. If you see, and that's just from the perspective of looking at the the stories that have been chosen about Jesus's life, uh, stories that are meant to be laying out a path for us, where Jesus is an exemplar of the spiritual path, not a man God who is to be worshiped as though he were a deity, which is the fundamental Western schismatic heresy that everyone <laughs> has inside. <laughs> not to put too fine a point on it. <laughs> that's not the term everybody else uses. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Sorry. Um, that's a great segue to Kutsa Nick, actually. <laughs> actually, uh, I'll jump in if that's okay, because uh, I, I do I do agree with you, Tim. But I, I think there's a... Yeah, it is all right. Mute, mute, mute. So... <laughs> Um, no, I, I, I think something that, that, that's really important to understand is it seems from the very beginning 
that the resurrection was an event, uh, something that happened, and I do think something happened, but uh, we'll get to that in a moment. But from the very beginning of the Christian traditions about the resurrection, it had a whole bunch of meanings, right? A whole bunch of nested meanings, both literal, symbolic, all those different layers, something we talk a lot about on the show. And just be and the, the neat thing about all this stuff, about Gnosticism, about religion, about creativity, is that we can get out of uh, A equals A, B equals B, 1 plus 1 equals 2, right? So just because one of these interpretations um, is right, it doesn't mean that the other ones are not, right? So I, 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 don't, I don't believe in a, in, a, in a physical resurrection in the way that, that, that people, and I'm also talking about my personal beliefs now, that, that I, I think some people think of uh, when they think of the Easter story. But, but I do believe in, 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 in that, that the earliest uh, followers of Jesus uh, experienced Jesus alive again after his crucifixion. Now, and, and these... When I say alive again, people back then knew, uh, like, you know, they believe I knew about ghosts. People believed in ghosts. They believed in vampires, right? <laughs> uh, they believed in visions. They believed in heavenly beings coming down and talking to you. So it's, it's they, they already have this background, but they're always very careful to point out that there's something different and special about Jesus coming back right? He's not coming back as a vampire. He, he lives again. He is alive in a mysterious way. Now, is that in a, in a physical way that they encountered him alive again? You know, I don't think so. But our earliest, uh, our earliest witness to the resurrection is Paul. And he's writing, what, like a, a decade after it happened? Uh, and it happened to him on the road to Damascus. Although that story is in Acts and not in his own letters, he does say that he, that he did encounter the living Christ. It's very important that it's the living Christ, right? The living Christ. Yes, that's right. The living Christ. That's right. Um, so well, and, I, sorry, to, okay. just the listeners, that's important yeah. because what we tend to do is read the Gospels, and when it says Christ, we always interpret that to mean Jesus. But that's not always clear. That's what the person writing meant. Yeah, bigger mm -hmm. concept than the than the human being. Go on, yeah. especially when we're talking about Paul, perhaps. So, um, and, and he has a, he has this mysterious story where um, I can't remember what he says. I think he probably says the Lord. Um, uh, he says that the, the Lord appeared to five hundred of his uh, five hundred people uh, all at once, and it's like, how come that was left out of the Gospels? And then we don't know. He just he just takes it because they're letters. He just takes it for granted. That, well, you know what I'm talking about. Okay, I'm getting off topic here. Uh, where was I going with all of this? Okay, yeah. So so resurrection. Uh, uh, like Tim was saying, it, it means to stand up. Uh, the standing, uh, the, uh, it also has connotations. It also means to, to awaken, to be awake. So, uh, and Jesus is sometimes referred to, the Christ is sometimes referred to, Jesus Christ is sometimes referred to in the earliest materials as the resurrected one, uh, which you could translate as the mm. awakened one. So we are constantly <laughs> being murdered in this life. We are constantly being killed in this life. Uh, archonic forces are constantly killing parts of us. Uh, it's the only way to live in this world. Uh, is to suffer a million little deaths. Um, and that, that's an important metaphor for me uh, because uh, the resurrection is something that, that constantly happens. It is uh, constantly happening to us. Uh, or, I mean, I shouldn't say that. Sometimes it's not happening to us, right? Uh, it's not happening for a lot of people. Uh, but when you're trapped in the world system, you need the power of the resurrection so that you can possibly re uh, 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 constantly resurrect. So for me, that's that's one of the resurrection's main metaphors, right? Now, is it a metaphor? Uh, I'm not going to say uh, say that, right? But it is. it, it has uh, metaphorical reflections and dimensions upon my own life. Oh, oh, right. And of course, I, you know, I don't think I need to, to spell it out, the awakened one, right? And all the connotations there and what that means and how when we become awakened in this world, how that is a form of resurrection. Um, okay, Nick, this time can for I, real. Can I just... Oh, wait, no, Tim, go for it. One little interjection. John, you said, um, you know, they, they believed in ghosts and spirits and they saw vampires and heavenly beings and, and things ascending. I just need to point out that through the the all of human history up to 300 years ago, that's a universal human experience, yes. Yes. right? And it remains a universal human experience on this planet today, except for people who are in a physicalist, rationalist, um, educated Western Anglo-Saxon driven head cage, right? Yeah. Where we're taught <laughs> Earth that that can't, ha it's just a dream, honey. It's just a dream. It wasn't real. Monsters aren't real. It's just a dream. Like you, you fed it through media all the time. You're told it by your parents all the time. School teaches you that all the time. So there's a reasonable hypothesis to kind of say it's a normal part of human experience unless someone's had it traumatically beaten out of them, which we all have. 
Yeah, that's that, that's an awesome an awesome point. And, and of course, I was just saying that to say that you know the the early writers were, were separating themselves from from these other things, right? There's something special about the resurrection for them because you have all these other connotations, all these sorry, you, you have all these other uh, uh, ways that people can come back from the dead, and they're very they're very implicit that that uh, sorry, they're very straight on that this is not what is happening, right? This is something different. This is something special. However, Tim, I I do want to stay with your point for a moment, which is which is something I say a lot in in my work with the AJC, right? Which is, if, if you talk to even diehard atheists, talk to atheists, talk to a lot of agnostics, then almost everybody, almost everybody, if you can get it out of them, has a story about something strange happening to them, something that does not fit into a materialistic worldview, okay? So it might just be, uh, you know, I, I thought I saw my grandfather, or I had a dream that came true the next day, or I had a bad feeling about getting on that plane. And actually, if you start talking, you know, if you start polling people, a shocking amount of people have seen ghosts. I think statistically, um, the, the, you know, the data is out there that a shocking amount of people have said that, they, that they've seen ghosts. So yeah, Tim, this, this is just below the surface. This can be drawn out. This does seem to be part of, of what it means to, to be human, unless it is suppressed and repressed. Um, Nick, for real. Um. Well, no, I think drawing on that, I, I think the question about the physicality of the resurrection um, is is interesting, mostly because, like it's already been said about kind of ghosts and vampires and that kind of universal experience. Like, if it was just that he got back up physically, like who cares <laughs> a little bit? Like that's a little, it's just not that interesting because it also already happened in the Gospels too. So I mean, so part of that, you know, with Lazarus, so that that's not like a unique occurrence. So. It's pretty clear to me at this point, you know, and John, you opened up to kind of modern interpretations. You can find Christian groups, esoteric groups, but also mainline, pretty mainstream groups and people in those churches that believe any, you know, number of a smorgasbord of opinions about the resurrection, um, including in churches like the Catholic Church or something where there's a very dogmatic opinion that's being put down. But if you talk to people in those churches, you're going to get a million different answers. So to me, what's interesting about it is what theologically speaking, you know what what is what is each belief or kind of idea about it doing uh for the people that are talking about it or or believing in that way because different ideas of the resurrection accomplish different things so i would say one really common one you know that i've been exposed to now in kind of more liberal christian circles is the resurrection as a resurrection into the community or into the movement or something like that that's a really common one you know and it's not that different than some of the things that you see in ancient texts either and then you know the one that I guess probably everyone here doesn't really like is that it's just a physical resurrection to prove how great God is. That one doesn't, to me, doesn't feel like it does that much theologically. So, yeah. um, and then there's the other one. So I think all that's interesting. One thing I did want to say about it is that, you know, in talking about the physicality of it, um, I would say that there is one, I always think of the story in Luke 24, which is also the, the road to Emmaus story, um, where there is a physical encounter with, with the resurrected Christ, but it's not with him as a human body it's actually you know they the the two disciples or whoever are walking on the road they encounter this guy he doesn't look like jesus or they would know um they hang out the guy says all this really great stuff and then he breaks bread with them and then in that they recognize him as jesus and then jesus vanishes so it's actually not very physical body like it really doesn't feel like that at all but it was in the physical encounter with a kind of sacramental meal that was <laughs> right uh, that the resurrection experience happened. So that to me is more interesting almost. And so good, <laughs> but it does, that's more Just available the, to us too. But so yeah. But the, but the I didn't real I didn't recognize him is one of those yeah. real key characteristics of the post-resurrection things. Even Mary Magdalene, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The yeah. very encounter with him, she doesn't see, she doesn't know him until he yeah. says the right thing, and then she goes, "Oh my God, Raboni," and you know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I can't help but go for like the blasphemous joke of he's in like kind of like a bad Groucho Marx uh, costume thing. Like, you know, like it's clearly Jesus with big glasses. Like, it was no, there was no plastic back then. So bad Groucho Marx, you know, masks were quite hard to come by. Someone someone had to hand sew the eyebrow. Yeah. Very complex. It's it's a Clark Kent Superman thing. As soon as he puts on the, the glasses, you know. He's um, the cowlick. And then yeah. <laughs> and then like, after he leaves the, the 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 disciples there after and they're like wait a second you know you see him turn to the camera and give the superman wink like <laughs> <laughs> um uh sorry nick i i jumped in D uh did you were you still going there uh no i'm okay <laughs> okay <laughs> sorry, i had to do a tech thing okay uh well while, while uh he he <laughs> performs blasphemous tech support uh i'll jump in um uh 
so I think for me, there's always a couple of things around, uh, like we've said before, the idea of like anything that seems like really miraculous or supernatural or like hard to parse in terms of what, what could actually happen that like you start, you should be skeptical. I think like, I also think about it like that because you're looking at, we're looking at texts that have been translated and reinterpreted like so many times over 2000 years and for so many different intentions over those years that you, I just have to start from the assumption that, that we're dealing with like the, the, the biggest game of telephone ever. And that like, what that, what that actual moment was like, so at one point I was walking through the city here in Calgary where I live and um, I had my headphones on and I didn't notice that I was walking across the train tracks right when uh, our city transit train was, was coming through and it honked its horn and I like looked up for a moment. I was terrified. I, it was coming and I was like, I was frozen. It was one of those things where you're frozen with fear. And then I broke myself out of it, jumped across the tracks and, you know, I'm, I'm, clearly I'm still here, but my life. <laughs> yeah. Yes, this, and this is the story of the resurrection. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah. I've been a ghost this whole time ever since. No, no. <laughs> It's a, that's the M. Night Shyamalan twist. And Jason's <laughs> been a ghost for like however many, 12 years since then. Um, but no, uh, but the, the, the experience, my life did flash before my eyes. And I did have a moment of like thinking about all the choices I'd made up to that point and the choices I was, that had like led me to that point. And like, there is kind of a, uh, and so like, if I was in that, in that period of my life, also perhaps, in a very um, uh, religious or spiritual or um, uh, a very deeply engaged process where I was discussing this philosophy with everybody all the, all the time, and I had a particular knack for words, then you could see how I could start talking about that experience in ways that could start to sound like I had died and come back, you know? Um, uh, not to mention, like, we've, we've also been talking about, like, the idea of the awakened, uh, versus like literally coming back from the dead and that, you know, um, so many of the, like the aphorisms of Jesus are kind of suggesting you to like, literally like let the past die, let the old way die and move into a new kind of life. Um, uh, that, that all of that can get really easily kind of get bundled together. So like aesthetically, I think the, the resurrection, it can be a, an incredibly powerful image and it's, Clearly, it's had it's had impact uh, despite uh, despite a lot of people disagreeing with it for a lot of years. So the story is powerful, and the, and the, I think the ideas behind it, or the ideas that inspired it, are powerful. I think my response, like how I, the the my biggest reaction to the to the idea of the resurrection, is is more about seeing the ways in which it's used in terms of dogma. Like if you're, when the dogma of the resurrection is used as like, in some cases, literally, this is the, this is the only way you get into heaven, into a direct literal heaven is by de de believing this direct literal thing that also just happens to carry along every other piece of baggage we need with it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that, that sort of, um, that usage of power is, I think, where I have the, uh, w w where my current understanding of it is why, like, I'm, I'm loath to take a direct or a literalist approach, mainly because I just don't like this idea that only one person has the keys or only one group of people have the keys, um, because I think that's only, like, always be skeptical of the person who says they have the keys when they're making that offer, you know? Um, yeah. So yeah, that's that's my take on it. Yeah, no, very cool. I, I think before we move on, you know, finally what I'll, I'll say is uh, I'll recommend people read, you know, getting into, you know, completely contradicting everything I said. Well, I'm not completely contradicting <laughs> everything I said, because as I said, it, it all it all works on multiple layers, people. But there, there's a very fascinating book by, uh, by a Jesuit priest, uh, Francis uh, Tissot. Tissot. Uh, it's called Rainbow Body and Resurrection, Spiritual Attainment, the Dissolution of the Material Body in the Case of Ken Po A. Cho. A leading authority on the rainbow body traces its history in the encounter of religions in medieval Central Asia, exploring a previously unimagined connection between early Buddhist Dzogchen and the resurrection of Jesus. 
So this idea of the rainbow body, this idea of the resurrection body, we do kind of find it in Paul. Like even Paul, if you read him closely, and anybody who says they completely understand Paul is a liar, right? Um, but uh, I completely understand Paul. That dude was tripped out. <laughs> um, well, it, it would it'd be a lot easier if we didn't just have half of, you know, his his side of the letters. And if he wasn't in the middle of some sort of angry rant. But, you know, that's, that's why I like him, because he's so human. He's, uh, he's a rascal. So, um, uh, the, 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 Paul seems to, to think that, 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 that Jesus did have a kind of physical resurrection, but in a resurrection body. So it's, it's not a soul, it's not a spirit, it's not a ghost, it's not quite the physical body. It is, it is the perfected human in an embodied of some kind form. And he says, you know, that Jesus is the first fruit. Someday we will all have these, these uh, resurrected bodies as well. Okay, so, uh, you know, I'm, again, I'm not saying that that's the only way to understand the resurrection. I, I think people uh, uh, catch on that, that, that I don't think it is. But this is a very interesting idea. And, and it is echoed in, in um, Buddhist tantric traditions about the rainbow body. And I think it could also be reflected on, on ideas about building the resurrection body. There's a long history in esoteric Christianity and Gnosticism was this idea that, that, you know, what's holding us together, what surrounds the divine spark, isn't isn't very strong stuff right so that's our physical body that's the ego what have you and when we die that stuff just goes and the divine spark gets, the divine spark stays stuck here so you need you need to build how does, something better. how does it go, how does it, go? it goes how does it go? so um so so to get to get out of here uh do you uh, and again i don't actually think gnosticism is, is is about getting out of here 100 percent, but we'll talk about that i'm sure at some point but after death to to at least mythologically to ascend to to the highest uh you uh you can't just do it with what you got so you build the resurrection body in this life and of course this can be an experience that you have now in this life and perhaps should um which is a uh, gnostic ascent so you can you build the resurrection body, and then you can ascend to have Gnostic experiences you, with the uh, you know way up there past the archons at the top. Come back down here in sort of a shamanic way and bring and share everything that 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 you have uh, learned. Now this this of course can also be metaphorical, right? And uh, I think going up there and going deep within ourselves is actually the same thing. And and maybe even the res building the resurrection body is a metaphor for you know, a, a kind of regime of, of, of purification, meditation, spiritual work, and what have you. But, but I do really like the, these ideas about the, about the resurrection body, building the body of light. And, and there's a lot of different esoteric technologies that, that claim to, 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 to be doing that. Um, and, and finally, what I'll say is for the resurrection and, and for Gnosticism, uh, you know, modern Gnosticism has a lot of connections to, to other, the, to, to esoteric uh, groups, esoteric uh, currents. Um, uh, and resurrection is very important in, in, um, in the rituals and in the understandings of, of groups like uh, Freemasonry and esoteric Freemasonry and Martinism. So this, this encountering and experiencing the resurrection for yourself uh, can, be, uh, can be ritually performed in these groups. And as Nick said, it's also ritually performed at any old church service. <laughs> so. I, I say one thing about that? I was just thinking, I mean, so since Please. you mentioned Paul, I think it follows there. I mean, you know, in, in Romans, which is obviously a favorite text in a in a totally you know mainstream context too is that paul obviously says that baptism is you being buried with in the death of christ and raised yes. in the resurrection so it's like you if you've done that which a lot of people have then you've already somehow if you just read that as it stands have had this experience of resurrection it might be interesting to be like what does that mean if that's serious you know rather than trying to point towards you know like having a visionary experience of jesus being resurrected or whether he would, you know, that happened 2000 years ago, whatever. But right there, Paul's just saying, you know, you've, you've been raised that way. So go from there. That, that to me is really interesting and accessible to, to us. So, yeah, yeah, a hundred percent. Okay. Well, we, uh, we solved that, uh, that 2000 year old question that has been, uh, around the, uh, the edges One... of Western civilization. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, no. And I, this is like, uh, Something that I just I just just been thinking about because I related that story of me possibly almost getting hit by a train, is that it also occurred to me that like crucifixion wasn't always like immediately deadly, and no. um, like part of me is also imagining like what if it is like the there was a literal uh, like historical Jesus literally crucified but doesn't die comes down but is supremely transformed you know like there, I don't know if I'm sure somebody has to have talked about this before. 
but uh but that could also be another way of like you know like like <laughs> if he was a rabble rouser before he got crucified you know <laughs> uh, like it just like takes it up to the it takes it up to 11 but anyway yeah. sorry no, that, that's fascinating there's a whole theory. monkey yeah. wrench there but i just uh, had a, had the theory and wanted to throw it out there yeah no do it i mean that's just it i think all these theories are right <laughs> so Ben zero zero eight, I hope I hope this has given you a lot to chew on. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, this is from Grandpa Chester. Uh, the the usual thing. I, I don't know, Jason, if you've caught the last couple shows. Uh, I know you've been very busy lately, but of course, uh, any complaints, uh, Jason at Nasa. <laughs> So I have so, heard you say that. <laughs> <laughs> so the the also the second part of that joke is we have not set up that email address for Jason. <laughs> so please keep sending those emails out with all of your complaints. Um, so for, putting that that uh, as an intro to the next question from Grandpa Chester. I know you all like to duck the topic of politics, but there has been a shift over the last twenty years eroding the dividing line. Uh, your church, that means uh, the AJC in this case, which sponsors the podcast, but of course it's not necessarily the, the people on the show are not necessarily connected to the AJC. Your church in overall tradition has a unique relationship to the political. So with all that in mind, what are your thoughts on the big C conservative Christian movement's recent pushes to codify in law and enforce a particular interpretation of morality derived from religious belief? Anybody else but me, please take that one. Can I, can um, I kick off as a non-American? Yeah. <laughs> well, we're, we're mostly non-Americans on this show, I guess. I don't know, Jason. Oh, no. probably say, do you want to? Do you want to hop in first? Uh, I, I'm I'm super fascinated by what you have to say. I think I'll, I'll come in more later, but um, I do question the usage of the term morality. But that said, you go ahead, Tim. Yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. Um, uh, Christianity as a whole has a complex relationship to power. Um, mm. the earliest material that we have in the Jesus tradition very strongly indicates that Jesus teaching had absolutely nothing to do with having anything to do with the power structures of the day. He's extremely explicit about it and he's extremely explicit about having nothing to do with money in a meaningful way. Right? So the, if, if he said anything political, it's about, um, some kind of wacko, non-dual, you know, off to the side. Hey, what if you just did this? That'd, that'd, you know, mess with people's heads a little bit. He's like an ontological anarchist or something. He's, his, his approach to the political is human to human, humans looking after each other, and then just doing stuff that makes sense to God and doesn't make sense to people. And that's it. That's unarguable from a scriptural perspective. There is no argument you can legitimately make based in the in the Jesus tradition that makes any sense of Christianity having anything to do with being in power. You cannot make that argument. If you're going to make the argument, you have to go to later material or you've got to go to earlier material. The earlier material is all in the Tanakh. And by the time the version of that tradition gets to the earliest people and certainly the versions that, um, that modern Christians rely on, that's a series of complex scriptural material that comes from diverse traditions that's been welded together to create the national myth of the nation of Israel, which is obviously has political motives. However, the nation of Israel was destroyed by the Roman imperial regime in 70 AD and no longer exists as a physical nation in that sense. There's a new nation of Israel that's a whole different thing. Just to kind of, let's not put that into the politics Q&A. <laughs> <laughs> We'll save that for the third show. <laughs> Maybe not. Anyway. There are very few tether points between the sayings of Jesus and anything that's in the Tanakh, in the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament. Um, very few. And, the, and they're very ambiguous what they mean when he, when he does say things. So you cannot rely on political statements in what we call the Old Testament to mandate Christianity having anything to do with power in the present day. People do it all the time. They're just wrong. I realize there are many theologians who disagree with me and I have no academic qualifications in the theology. Therefore, I feel free to say they're just wrong. There is no justification for saying it. The reason we do it and the reason the all evangelicalism is really emerges from Western Christianity, which, which is the schismatic heresy in which the entirety of Christianity in North America and Australia and Canada all inherits. And that's all based in the Church of Rome. The weird 
um, situation where this strange, this strange Near Eastern mystery cult that emerges in in Palestine um, becomes the state religion of the Roman Empire fifty years after being illegal and getting people thrown to lions. What? How does anybody keep their heads on straight? Um, if you look at the shape that Christianity takes further east as it manifests in Persia, in India and China in the first millennium, it's got nothing to do with power. It remains a strange mystery cult where people say cryptic things um, that have nothing to do with politics. They're, or when I say politics, I mean gaining political power. But what happens in the West is the church and the Roman Empire become welded together, and then the church and all the feudal regimes throughout Europe over the next thousand years become welded together. Um, and so Christianity winds up with a strange story about itself that it's meant to be somehow a state power, which it is not well suited to do. Um, it's a really bad match. <sighs> that gets inflected through Anglo-Saxon um, weird ideas about divine rights of kings and whatever. And that's what you inherit by the time you get to North America in both Canada and the United States and Australia and New Zealand and lots of other places, um, which is just, it's, my God, I've lost count of how many layers of stupid there are in getting to that point. <laughs> <laughs> like, like there's, that's, that's there's a layer of stupid piled one on the other until you get <laughs> where anything a conservative Christian, conservative evangelical Christian in the United States makes any sense at all. So hang on. I feel like I've drifted from the question. But uh, pushes to a recent codifying law and enforce the particular right. Okay, here's what Christianity in the modern era most needs: secularism, because it becomes free to become a spiritual tradition when it's entirely isolated from the machinery of power. That's what happens in the Church of the East in you know between 200 and 700 B uh, CE, and they produce some of the most luminous spiritual material that exists in the Christian tradition. Christianity needs to be utterly isolated from the machinery of power. Secularism is the, is the means by where that should be done. The United States is meant to be a secular country. Somehow somebody has layered more stupidity and fumbled the ball so many times it's not even clear they're on the same football pitch. That concludes. I think I've lost coherence and I'm going to see the field. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump yeah. in uh, uh, rather quickly. To, just to say that, as Tim has said on other shows, there are apparently other countries that, that aren't America, um, and that's something else to remember when you when you're discussing. Is there, any, is there anywhere outside of New York, really? <laughs> <laughs> and, None of it's and, real, man. None of it's real, but it exists. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, too, when, when you're looking at politics or these particular uh, political developments uh, in connection to religion, uh, specifically Christianity, you know, Gnosticism is a system for dealing with stuff like this. It is what it was invented for, right? Uh, it, it, uh, another Tim Ramp, but, but something that, that I've often said is, is Gnosticism is, is not a parody or a critique of Judaism or Christianity. It is a parody and critique of all religion, okay? <laughs> while being a religion. It's a hermeneutic, it's a way of looking at the world, it is a way of understanding the world, and it is a way of understanding how religion works. So when you look at developments like this through Gnostic eyes, they make a lot of sense. We have the toolbox, we, uh, we have uh, uh, the counterpoint to this, um, but you know, the counterpoint is, is not that strong because it's not our world. So uh, Nick, go off, it's supposed well, to be I, Yeah. <laughs> I think like drawing on that, and so I think John, you and I have talked about Harold Bloom a long time ago. Yeah, I yeah. I know you like him, right? So we, we really yeah. need to do a show on. Yeah, so. be, yes. yeah. 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 He yeah. considered yeah. himself a Gnostic. So yeah, so I've been yeah. rereading the American religion, and so you know, the, one of the things I read recently in there is that he, you know, Harold Bloom's overall thesis is that the American religion is a kind of Gnosticism, and you can you know take that or leave that, but that there, but that the evangelical tradition, this kind of attempt to you know, a Christian nationalist gain power and make this a Christian nation or whatever is kind of bad Gnosticism and is actually a worship of the Demiurge. And you can kind of see that really well in kind of what John just said. This is, Gnosticism gives you tools to see how, not just, I think, critique religion, but how world systems are created and, and the kind of Christian nationalist world system is pretty clearly Demiurgic in the sense that it claims obedience from everyone. It says that it's the only legitimate system and it wants you to worship it. So <laughs> that seems really clear. So I think Sounds at familiar. that point, Harold Bloom, you know, is really accurate. So that's how I feel about it. 
Yeah, no, I, I think Harold Bloom is, is spot on, actually. And it's something that you, Jason and I have talked about a lot on the show. It's uh, something uh, uh, I'm sort of discussing in, in, in some of my research academically, uh, which is that the Gnosticism is incredibly influential. And there are a lot of Gnostic ideas floating out there that have been on board from the wider from wider systems. And of course, it's Gnosticism systems. But, you know, when you take just one of these ideas and uh, you don't uh, have a loop in with a bunch of others, it's very easy to to make it into a bad idea. I'm, this is making sense, right? Because you know the, the, we're talking about how Christianity can become bad, uh, but but you know I, I think there are specific ideas from Gnosticism that have become on board, uh, that are very influential and are floating around and have been uh, interpreted in unhelpful ways. Um, go ahead. <laughs> Just a um, one hundred percent, Nick, and I have said the same thing myself, like a, a, a bunch of times. But it is, it is literally, it is literally an iconic demiurgical. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. um, the other thing I just want to note is that it's important in working within the U.S. context and the broader Anglosphere, if you like, to place to historicize everything that's going on at the moment as an aspect of. Um, political culture war politics, which, which is a, it's a specific historical moment where certain discourses are created and fabricated by political actors with the intent of gathering electoral majorities in order to remain in power. Um, and conservative Christians may think that what they're doing is pushing a certain political agenda, but what's also happening is culture war politics has captured the, the pseudo moral concerns of conservative Christians to to tap on Jason a little bit there, uh, the pseudo moral <laughs> concerns of, of uh, conservative Christians and recruit them as a voting body in order to keep people who are in power in power. Um, and, you know, it's the politics of power, really. Yeah, and, it's, it's, and, uh... and, and the culture war strategy is a, is a Bush era, or slightly prior to Bush era strategy that pertains both on right and left, entirely drives the entirety of US politics at the at the national electoral level and bleeds over into Canada, Australia, the UK, and to a lesser extent, New Zealand for interesting reasons. But um, everything has to be understood through that particular historical discursive moment because it's a specific moment. It began, which means hypothetically, it can end. <laughs> yeah, oh, sorry. Yeah, goes yeah. yeah. I just to jump in. I mean, the other thing with the Harold Bloom piece there that I actually just to say one thing about America, because I'm really interested in like Americana and Amer the ideas of America and theology. And it's one of the things I've been working on, too. And, you know, there's the other argument with that is that there is an alternative tradition in kind of American religion that's very individualistic. That's, uh, you know, kind of close to this ontological anarchism that Tim described is it can be seen in, in the stories of Jesus. And that you know american evangelical religion isn't really that american historically it's, it's pretty like you're saying it starts at a certain point it's a particular historical movement i mean i would argue that doesn't really have that much to do with some of the stuff that you know harold blue and other people like some of the death of god theologians who talk about this too you know there's a there's a there's a kind of secularizing aspect in american religion that is really absent from this evangelical movement so you know it doesn't feel particularly american to me i guess Hmm. Uh, uh, Tim, what you're talking there, like I often describe it as like a sort of portfolioizing, like that uh, um, once you get a group and that group is more or less solidified around certain certain subjects, as new crises come in, there is new debate points come in, uh, people will take a side. And then if you're if you're if the side taken, like if the portfolio that you agreed with on everything else takes side X, then that's now your side, you know. Often, I think that's the case. Like I've, I've uh, made the statement, um, and I am not speaking for the AJC in any way here, just in case any. <laughs> but like that, I would say that the 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 Venn diagram of people who deny the usage of masks is probably uh, overlaps quite a lot with the people who deny that climate change is a thing. Um, and that's not because I'm trying to say that those people uh, are are uniformly bad in the same way, but that the group they were already part of that was rejecting something is now rejecting another thing. Um, and uh, uh, <laughs> got a problem? Email jason at gnosticwisdom.net. Um, uh, and so like in, in terms of the, 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 the usage of Christian movements or Christian 
vague Christian symbolism, language, etc., to uh, to justify things is to me like is more about that messy rat's nest of of uh, of ideas that have been lashed together to assemble a voting block than it than it has anything to do with any theological thought or process or and yeah like the reason I took a, took issue with the word morality is that a lot of these issues themselves uh, avoid so many other moral questions when they're fighting any particular note, like the whole Roe versus Wade thing that, you know, they will fight to the quote unquote death uh, for for this particular subject and then ignore all of the other moral responsibilities that subject will then lead to, you know? Um, so, uh, so, so for them, like for me, for them to say that it's a moral fight is is uh convenient <laughs> is maybe the nicest word i have for it um, it's an insult to morality jason it's an insult to morality exactly yeah um the uh uh one of the so like and kind of to go back to the the 2000 years of of layers of stupid which is such a great way to say it tim um one of the things that i found really interesting is when i listened to a podcast that was called the history of rome really great podcast it covers the founding of the city of uh, the, the founding of the city of rome like way back whenever to the fall of the Western Roman Empire, because someone else had already started doing a podcast on the on the East. Um, uh, it's like 190 episodes that are all half an hour. Go and listen after you're done listening to this podcast. But from when when Christianity comes into the the, the, the podcast because it's going through the history, and the podcaster keeps himself pretty neutral. He doesn't kind of take a position on any validity or truth to Christianity. Simply, this is a thing that is happening in the history. But one thing that I learned was that the history of Rome is pretty much the history of Catholicism, like as once it gets into the state religion and like so many things that we see in the church have so much more to do with Rome than they have to do with, with uh, anything we know that, that uh, happened 2000 years ago. And so that to me, like, is like, I think that that's where the sort of the rot sets in is when you, it's all about uh, maintaining power. Exactly. Uh, okay. Well, we also solved that one. That's, this, is, this is easy. I thought that these were complicated philosophical <laughs> questions. Um, okay. Something I've been thinking you about lately. Sufficient ideological conformity, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Something I've been thinking about lately that seems to be rarely discussed outside of schizo posting is the influence the archons have had on human history. Specifically, what have the archons been doing to direct our historical de development, either through puppets and agents or by directly incarnating themselves for a lifetime? That is from Pussington Old One. I will start with that one. Okay, Gnosticism, uh, the Gnostic myth makes characters out of entities, universal forces, and ideas so that we are able to grasp it, right? So it is, again, it is, it, it, you know, it's, it's trying to explain a, a rocket to a kid, right? Well, you know, okay, you know, you're not actually a rocket scientist. The kid can't actually understand uh, what's going on. So you're like, okay, well, the, 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 the astronaut pushes the button, and then there's fire, and then the rocket goes to the moon, right? So, uh, sorry, I'm not, and, and Pussington, I, 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 I'm, not, I, I'm not talking down to you with this, <laughs> this example, right? I don't think you're a child in that. We're all children. So what, what we've got to stop doing, like, is... is is really personifying the the archons, right? Like again, this is this is getting into kind of kind of sci-fi, heavy metal, uh, uh, dark fantasy. You know, these these uh, extra-dimensional puppet masters. You know, out there as as separate beings. So so you're you're saying like you know what have the archons been doing to to direct their like the archons don't direct anything. They don't have to direct anything. Like the ar this is the archons. This is the archons world, right? I'm, and also, I'm the Archon, and you're the Archon, and we're all Archons, and they're in our flipping our heads, you know? They, they are the personification of the world system. So w when you're asking questions about, you know, how, how, how do the Archons influence the world system, you know, they are the world system. Um, so I, I think looking at the world system, looking at the Archonic forces that have been pushed into your head by that system, looking at some of the Archonic forces that seem to be part of our human heritage that are not built uh, into us by society, this is how we come to understand uh, the Archons. Uh, that's my take. Anybody else? Go ahead. 
I feel like I've missed a golden opportunity to open with the question betrays a profound misunderstanding of the material. <laughs> <laughs> I catch my waiting for that. <laughs> but you, you, you got in first, John, and I think I think the point's well made. Um, yep. Just two things I want to I want to throw in. Yes, I absolutely am on the same page with you that the most productive way to view the this notion of archons and the demiurge that we have from Gnostic, from the Gnostic material in a contemporary way that that. Um, helps us make sense of contemporary life rather than um, might mislead us into into thinking that's a little bit more superstitious in a Stevie Wonder sense. Um, because you know everybody, if you believe in things that you don't understand, then you suffer. Superstition ain't the way. I, I deny ever having used that in a sermon. I don't. <laughs> I have used that multiple times in a sermon. Um, one thing is just to, I'm very fond of Walter Wink's take on the the Archons. I think that's I think his work is really helpful and pivotal. And um, the Powers trilogy. There's the Powers trilogy, which is Tim, long. Nick, how come you never told me about this guy? <laughs> He's never brought him yeah, up before. I, I don't know who this is. I don't want to steal your thunder, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> I've never posted about this. The Powers trilogy is, is long and magisterial, but there's a short book that summarizes it, which the title of which I can't remember. Nick will know. Uh, it's Cracking the Gnostic Code, Cracking the, the Gnostic Powers in Gnosticism. Yeah. yeah, worth reading if you're into, into Gnosticism. What Wink is saying is that the ways in which these this concept that we're calling archons manifests in human reality is through organizations. It's through yeah. us as we act in collectives. So I've got a I've got a reason for that. I want to touch on before I before I finish, but. Um, he has this beautiful idea that um, all organizations are by their nature fallen, um, but they're also possible to redeem, but the work of redemption is constant. So I take that to mean that whenever we're functioning in a group, in a collective, in an organization, in a team, in a family, in, in a company, in a not-for-profit and whatever, we have to remain awake the entire time because the thing is going to try and run off on its own. Um, right. And, and its interests aren't human interests. It's got its own whole thing it's trying to do. So that's multiplied vastly if you talk about organizations on the scale of Facebook or McDonald's or the United States or NATO or OPEC or, right? But even on the, on the smallest scales, organizations have their own agendas that aren't fundamentally human agendas. They're, they're, they're off doing their own thing. So that's one thing is read, read Walter Wink, <laughs> but really understand that there's no such thing as a good organization because the organization is never operating according to human needs. It's never operating. It might have a not-for-profit purpose statement or a mission haiku of some kind that says it's working for the benefit of something or other. I've if written any, many of them. Yes, indeed. <laughs> if, you've ever worked, if you've ever worked for a not-for-profit, I, I wager the majority of your are being treated monstrously unethically by your employer who claims to be doing ethical work on behalf of the world you know yeah. um why does that happen and that's my my other part so um you know the psychological models that i tend to use always we, we always talk in terms of the ego and the shadow being components of the the greater expanse of the self the shadow is the denied disowned aspects of our self that is a continuous process of, of real time construction that we're always doing in terms of our, our inner impulses. Um, exemplified in a mythical way in Sophia giving birth to the Demiurge and then pretending that never happened, hiding the Demiurge in a, in a cloud behind a throne or a throne behind a cloud, I can't remember, and then just going about a, a business as though it had never occurred, right? So that's the that moment, I think that's why Jung was so drawn to the Gnostic material, perhaps, is that's an archetypal depiction of the process of repression, right, which we do all the time. Yeah. So the trick, with the shadow, which operates in us all psychologically, according to these models all the time, it's, it's still there, it's still functioning, it's driving what we're doing at a, at an unconscious, in an unconscious way. When we get together in groups, th that shadow functioning interlocks behind ourselves almost so we've got the conscious thing that we say we're doing with each other and our shadow functioning is all interlocking kind of in an in a mutually unconscious way we get glimpses of it in each other but we can't ever see it in ourselves mm. those things interlock to create the unconscious functioning of organizations so organizations wind up with 
shadow functioning made of the interconnected shadow functioning of the people, right? Um, no, <laughs> when it's the stuff we're all trying to pretend we're not, <laughs> it's not mm -hmm. surprising that organizations wind up doing, you know, at the, at the very least, um, ineffective things, and at the worst, truly horrible things. So mm -hmm. if I were trying to, summary, <laughs> if I were trying to look for the <laughs> way in which archons are most active in the world, um, work on your shadow, <laughs> maintain ruthlessly, con constantly, consciously, continuously aware of the organizations that you're playing in and how they can be, how you can participate in the work, the ongoing and continuous work of redeeming the organization. Yeah. No, that, that's awesome. And, and, and I completely agree with that too. And again, for the, for these multi-layers. And, and I think when, when I hammer these points home, because we get a lot of questions about the Archons and Demiurge uh, when we do these shows, and they're very exciting ideas, uh, particularly when you're new to Gnosticism. So it's easy to fixate on them. So I don't want people to think that that I am a, um, a strict materialist, that I'm not, uh, that, that in no way a supernaturalist, because that, that's not true at all. And, and I think there is a use uh, and an understanding and a lair where the archons are entities. But it, it, it's not helpful, particularly if you're new to Gnosticism, to think that way, if that makes sense. Maybe it would have been more helpful a thousand years ago, right? Or 500 years ago, or 2,000 years ago with a slightly different worldview. Because the archons are all these things, right? But I think in the modern world, if, particularly if you're new to Gnosticism, if you really think of these things as, as entities, you will give yourself severe mental illness, right? Because you will fall into that that dark city, um, uh, Lord of the Rings, uh, the Game of Thrones, White Walkers, uh, um, uh, 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 reptilian, uh, they live, uh, uh, paranoid. David Icke. Um. Yeah, David Icke, exactly. Yes, precisely. Well, well I mean, okay, th sorry, Dan. No, no, please, I, I was done. Uh, no, I think it's, yeah, I mean, what I hear from Tim, and I, I love Walter Ring too, so I agreed with all that, it's just that, you know, there's a lot, and John, you as well, is that there's a danger in externalizing these things to the point where you don't see how they're within you and you're enmeshed in them. So yeah. this idea that it's an archon can be incarnate in like one person that pulling the strings or something like that. I mean, I think just the mention of shit so posting is interesting because, you know, one of the things just where a lot of this kind of online conversation about like Gnosticism and memes and sort of that sort of stuff, uh, it comes on, you know, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, or like that, which to me, it's like one of the most easy exp ways of, of uh, you know, giving an image of an archontic system <laughs> that you could find because they all function based on algorithms that don't, uh, like Tim says, don't have a human purpose in mind um, and that mm -hmm. promotes certain content above other types of content that might, you know, get people more paranoid and more distrusting each other and more in conflict for a purpose that has nothing to do with, you know, unveiling truth, but is, you know, obviously about a profit margin for a demiurgic tech corporation so i mean right. and that that feels worse and more paranoid than thinking there's somebody out there who's an incarnation of a spirit because you know i'm on those platforms all the time all day so what you know that means i'm living in it for real so that's kind of scary so maybe you don't you don't need the the lizard people stuff to be paranoid and and anxious about our reality yeah that that's for sure uh I, you know the, the, Oh, sorry, Chase. I was just going to say one point that you can go <laughs> off, King. Uh, a phrase I learned from social media, and it's colonized <laughs> my brain. Um, the, 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 oh, geez, what was my incredibly... Uh, oh, wait, here's my incredible point. Uh, that, that's really interesting, Nick, because when I read the Gnostic uh, scriptures, it seems like when they're talking about the Archons and the Demiurge are trying to describe a concept like artificial intelligence, but they don't have that concept yet. Mm. So, uh, and again, I think we can even tie that into what, what Tim is saying as well, or Walter Wink is saying about, you know, organizations kind of take on an artificial consciousness. It is, the organizations have a consciousness, right? But it's not quite a human consciousness. And, organizations and I think, are people too. Yeah, that's right. Thank you, Jason. Actually, wow, this is actually, the, all Legally. jokes aside, this is really coming together quite well. <laughs> Corporations are people too. Uh, but particularly, it, it, it's really, I, I think, profound, Nick, that when, when you talk about the algorithms, really hammering home this direct connection to, to a form of AI and mm -hmm. uh, archonic uh, consciousness. Okay, uh, Jason, hit it. Um, so I'm going to start off actually with a quote from Alan Moore um, on Ooh. conspiracies, because uh, I think this will this will sort of connect. Um, yeah. So, because uh, he did a um, a, a graphic novel, uh, like nonfiction graphic novel about the history of the CIA, called Brought to Light, which is uh, drawn by Bill Sienkiewicz, 
beautiful work. And then he actually did a narrated version where he played like the the the, um, uh, the narrator is this like old decrepit eagle that's kind of acting like a salesman. He's got this briefcase full of murder and death, and he's just like he's got this like gravelly voice. It's great and haunting. But anyway, while he was doing all this research, so he, like he was learning all of this stuff about the CIA. Um, this is a quote that he came out with afterwards. Yes, there is a conspiracy. In fact, there are a great number of conspiracies that are all tripping each other up. And all of these conspiracies are run by paranoid fantasists and ham-fisted clowns. If you are on the list targeted by the CIA, you really have nothing to worry about. If, however, you have a name similar to somebody on a list targeted by the CIA, then you are dead. The main thing I learned about, about conspiracy theory, is that conspiracy theorists actually believe in a conspiracy theory because that is more comforting. The truth of the world is that it is chaotic. The truth is that it is not the Jewish banking conspiracy or the gray aliens or the 12 foot reptilioids from another dimension that are in control. The truth is more frightening. Nobody is in control. The world is rudderless. And that, that notion of the conspiracy being more comforting is something I keep coming back to, particularly as Gnosticism and the conversations around it intersect with uh, conspiracy proponents. Um, uh, I think that notion, so like the, the question of, of uh, have been doing to like literally direct our historical development either through puppets and agents or directly incarnating themselves is and not to not not, not to suggest uh, anything negative about you uh, Punkington 01 but that but I would I would encourage you to consider that wanting there to be uh, spiritual beings who have done something literally and directly evil that you could point to is more comforting than the more complicated answer of uh of people who have like of these interlocking un unacknowledged shadow selves like the, that uh tim was talking about um that are perpetuating assumptions um that are that are externalizing uh cruelties um uh that are messy and complicated to unravel um that and that, like, I think one of the things the uh, Tim's note about, like, your your question uh, betrays a profound misunderstanding of the text, is that uh, to me, anytime I see any question about Gnosticism or any statement about Gnosticism, that is clearly that they've just mapped a higher level of truth on top of the previous truth that they're now rejecting. That, like, that's that's where my flags go up. Um, the 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 value uh, uh, john you were talking about gnosticism as a um uh as something that's always been present as, as like a way to, to decode and unravel a lot of this stuff or decrypt it mm -hmm. is that that's like at our best we are able to disentangle uh to, to start to see the the arconic influences around us and then choose something different choose to be more present for our community, choose to be more present for the person across the street. Um, uh, there was a, a really good book by Rebecca Solnit called A Paradise Built in Hell, um, where, uh, the, and it, I, don't, I, I don't think there's any real religious uh, um, inclinations in the book whatsoever, but her main premise is that when disasters happen, so like wildfires, earthquakes, you know, uh, just like industrial explosions, what have you, um, that more often than not, people tend to, on their own, gather together and help. Yeah. And that oh, the only time things go wrong is when somebody who probably was in power before the disaster comes in to try to influence that power after the disaster um, or reinstate that power after the disaster. But that the, the disaster, the, the mini apocalypse, actually kind of resets the board and allows everybody to just care for each other. And that I that is something that that the the, uh, the, the Gnostic optimist in me um, takes that as as uh, uh, a way to to take that step away from those arconic forces. Um, I think my only other thought about uh, requiring there to be a truth about archons it kind of goes back to my whole thing about being nervous about somebody who's uh, like about the the crucifixion demanding that someone has the keys is that if someone is selling you something or asking you to subscribe to something like quite literally like financially yeah like based on the front, like like patreon yeah. uh or anything like that where they're where they're saying that they're going to tell you the truth yeah. about these forces be very concerned because that is an that is an arconic system perpetuating itself mm -hmm. yeah.
Yeah, so subscribe for as little as a dollar for pizza <laughs> meat you promote, and we will tell you. As the Lord the said, as the Lord said, render unto God what is God's, and render unto Patreon what is Patreon. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Actually, you know what, what we should do is is every patron gets a Gnostic indulgence. So when you die, you're not going to be stuck in that seventh heaven with Stapy off. You can, can you can the, get up. They could get the secret passwords, so they can make it through the toll booth. That's great. right. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. I try that to piss off all the rational Orthodox folks as much as the Gnostics. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Seraphim Rose. Okay. Um, I'm going to very quickly answer the next question and pass it on to Nick because uh, the, the, I definitely one of the reasons I definitely had to have Nick on this show. I think he probably has a, a particularly on this episode. Uh, uh, I, I imagine he'll have a few things to say. Uh, so here we go. But I'm going to very quickly start off on this one. Uh, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on the ideology and beliefs on the rising, quote unquote, trad calf movement in North America mm -hmm. by Graham Patchester. If you don't know what the trad calf movement is, I bet you Nick will explain. And mm -hmm. I'll also uh, I'll put in some some notes in the show notes. You can read the New York Times a long article, which I think is called "The Hottest Club in New York City Is the Catholic Church." Now I'll I'll tell you about my thoughts about uh, the trad calf movement which is uh, somebody in the Red Scare Pod Reddit said that I have a horrif horrifying soy boy phenotype. So <laughs> that, I say, that's a joke that you only get if you watch. Oh my TV. God, I have no idea what you just said. <laughs> <laughs> right? Right? Uh, uh, exactly, exactly. Um, I unfortunately know what you just said. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, um, anyways, just based on that, trad calf must be bad. Okay, Nick. Yeah, well, it's bad. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's the main, but I, you know, I, I have like three things about this. So I'm trying to fit, cause I could just talk about this all the time probably, but, Go for it. um, Ooh. yeah, the main thing, the main thing is this, so this New York, so trad calf is this, you know, people probably know traditional Catholics are a group of Catholics who, you know, emphasize pre Vatican II, so pre 1960s aspects of catholic tradition and practice so the latin mass you know you know older old school catholic devotions um i kind of usually it's tied with a political reactionary idea about wanting the catholic church to have secular power in some way so some of them are like monarchists and they want yeah, that like whole they're they're empire they're <laughs> yeah 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 right Integral. Another well, then... two people will get <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, yeah, so that's like the basic, but then this trad Catholic thing that's coming up now is a very online phenomenon. Yeah. So, you know, part of the important thing and the New York Times, which is just kind of annoying, people have pointed out that they've been writing a lot of editorials about this. So somebody there just likes this trend piece idea or something. But um, the idea there is that a small group of people in downtown Manhattan, which is like called Dime Square, which is in Chinatown, about 15 minutes from where I am right now. Um, have a trend of converting to Catholicism, including the person John mentioned, the host of the Red Scare podcast um, and some others. And so it, so that's what they mean. And it's kind of like a decadent, transgressive, like anti-wokeness trend. Um, it's really aesthetic. Doesn't, I mean, even the article is like, most of these people don't actually go to confession or church or it's more of an aesthetic trend. Um, you know, a few years ago, there was a med exhibit about Catholic aesthetics that kind of, I feel like influenced some of these people, like some of them admitted that. And then there's like the young Pope and memes about the young Pope. And I feel like there's a whole aesthetic culture there that's online mostly. So like the other day I was at dinner with my Chinese side of the family, many of whom were born or raised around New York City's Chinatown. And they did not know what Dime Square was. They have never heard that term. <laughs> they were like, who are, who are those people? We were actually supposed to go to a restaurant right there, uh, which got closed by the health department, which is another story. But they really did not know that this was a trend or anything. So I think average people don't really know about this, which is good. Yeah, well, um, they do now yeah. because of the New York Times. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so, so then, so more importantly, the second thing about it, I just want to say is that I think a lot of the people, I think both the New York Times kind of liberal secular people and these trad Catholics don't actually understand that there are multiple Catholicisms. Yeah. So mm. there are many, Catholicism is a huge religion with it's billions of people. people. Yeah, it's <laughs> thousands of years old. There's many versions of it. A lot of them are really bad. <laughs> so I'm not saying that this is just one that's bad. <laughs> <laughs> but there are others that are not. So the the thing about it is it's it's complicated where there's there's you know, just in my own life, I mean part of the reason this affects me a lot is because definitely the tendency of, you know, this kind of nineteenth century transgressive decadent Catholicism was really appealing to me for a long time. I was like a literature major for a while. So I was into a lot of this stuff too. 
But then the Catholicism, you know, that I learned about more in seminary by a Jesuit professor who was actually banned by Pope Benedict to write and teach was this kind of more liberationist Catholicism that is more modern and engages with other religions and, you know, Latin American liberation theology. Um, you know, there's kind of like uh, Buddhist Christian dialogue, like there's lots of Zen masters who are Jesuits, like there's like a lot of forms of Catholicism. But for people into trad Catholicism, they're kind of into that narrative that I think a certain type of secular liberal New Yorker also helps them push, which is that there's only one Catholicism, which is this kind of scary uh, pre-Vatican II traditionalist Catholicism, which is technically not even, to my, in my mind, the main problem in Catholicism, because I like a lot of stuff that Pope Francis says and does, but the hierarchical post-Vatican II moderately conservative church is more dangerous in a lot of ways than that's my own personal politics mm -hmm. than the traditionalists because they actually have power and political influence um so that you know whereas traditionalist catholics is, doesn't currently doesn't really have a lot of tr influence or power it's not what you'll get in most catholic parishes so it, yeah i mean that's the thing it's like a trend piece but that that issue of, of only thinking there's one form of this religion i think is, is really problematic and then finally i would just say that if you're online a lot, you already know that trad is not just Catholic. There's a lot of alt-right reactionary Neoplatonists and Thelemites and uh, Greco-Roman pagans and stuff. So to me, more this conversion to this is more of a conversion to some aesthetic ideology that allows you to condemn the idea of wokeness or something and doesn't really have a lot to do with religious belief. So I think whether you're, yeah, if you're like an alt-right Thelemite or an alt-right trad Catholic, you pretty much say the same stuff. You could say it in a slightly different like aesthetic register. So yeah. Those well, are yeah maybe another, like, another, the new monarch of England is yeah. uh, clearly a traditionalist. Uh, yeah. You know, it's all, it's all become very mainstream. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Nick, Nick's going to start uh, Radnos on uh, his block. He, he's, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to say where he, live, where he lives, but uh, he's going to declare it Nickel, uh, Nickel Square. So uh, Rad Knots <laughs> on uh, uh, Nickel Square is going to be the next the next big trend you can read about in the New York Times. Yeah. No, John, uh, John, we're going to do it at Mile End, and we'll call it Looney Square. Looney Square, thank you. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, perfect. Okay, uh, for, Rad, for Rad any, Knots. anyone listening, Canadian dollars are called loonies. <laughs> <laughs> Rad, Rad Knots, Looney Square, and the Mile End. Done. And we, I, I like, we can do the decadent Catholic thing, right? Yeah. Like we can mix that in. Like I, I own a lot of, a lot of, uh, of nice silk robes. I can smoke opium and <laughs> well, then go to confession. Yeah. That was another, th I, that's another point that I could probably say, which is that I'll, if you actually are into that aesthetic, you know, a lot of the churches involved, whether they're Anglo Catholic Episcopal churches or like independent sacramental churches are not actually like psycho reactionary traditionalist conservatives usually. So that aesthetic doesn't have to be married to this thing but in this case it's used for that it's, so when it's roman catholic that's usually not good <laughs> so yeah. it's the, issue. the uh um it kind of gets me thinking about what i was saying there before about that portfolioizing that like um there's a I, I getting a sense that there's like that the 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 very online anti-woke sort of um in uh like semi-troll transgressive cloud you know, um, can kind of like, can sort of absorb this and then take it in. But there's also, I'm also kind of getting like that, um, like remember when we were wringing our hands about 15 years ago about the definition of the word hipster? Like, yeah. <laughs> um, and and the, like the whole thing with like, um, about one-upping the people who you were with on how authentic you were in your knowledge or your, or how you were making your own beer or whatever it was. And that like, which also came out of that, like that same general New York vibe, like I'm, this ultimately feels like sort of like hipster cosplay Catholicism. Like, uh, let me let me uh, one up you with my trivia knowledge on Catholic trivia night. Like, yeah. um, but not like a taking deep into your soul and any of these any of the questions involved. Um, uh, I had a, I had a whole other question there that I was going to ask you, uh, Nick, but it uh, it popped out of my head, so I'll let I'll let yeah. Tim jump in. I'm. Oh. I'm I don't not, have not, to. Not, okay. not <laughs> well, you know, right. I, on one hand, it's, it's... I was going to I was going to tease Nick a little bit and and just sort of say, in 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 defense of the people who think there's only one Catholicism, Catholicism at the at the peak hierarchical level is at extreme pains to portray. The oh yeah, <laughs> actually, I think that's a good point though because some of this actually plays right into the the hierarchy. You know, they they don't actually. I mean, I would say the hierarchy is generally not. Tradcast. It's not actually what 
the Catholic hierarchy is, but this notion there's one Catholicism is what the hierarchy of the Catholic Church wants because a lot of these other forms that I mentioned, like liberation theology, have been you know persecuted and marginalized for decades in the church. Right. So pretty much right. everything good <laughs> that came out of the Catholic Church. So and anything I like. So I mean that you know that's important. It plays right into the hands of that group. Oh. Uh, one thing that I like, so uh, I, the, the least Christian and Catholic of the of the four of us, um, as a question, is that like one thing I read when I read that New York Times piece, it said something, or like I think it alluded to something to the effect of that Catholicism overall it will accept people whether or not their reasons for joining aren't aren't uh, uh, pure, if that makes sense. That it's not about like, um, yeah, but... like if you join and then do all the things and say the things. We don't actually care what you really think in your in your deep part of your soul. Just sign on, um, and that and that that was maybe part of why they felt it was why they the the sort of the the, the fashionista element of it was like uh, was why it made it so easy for Catholicism to absorb that versus like Eastern Eastern Orthodoxy or something like that, um, which has probably even more cool detail to to nerd out about. Um, yeah. Is that is that a thing? I mean, I, well, I would, for one thing, I would say that there is a, a group of Eastern Orthodox people that are like this too. So th there's a problem <laughs> in American Orthodox churches of being infiltrated by like white alt-right people too. So, uh -huh. but I don't know. I mean, in my, I, you know, I actually did get confirmed as a Catholic as an adult and I would not, and it was in a pretty, it wasn't actually even in a progressive space. It was in like a mainline-ish conservative-ish space. And I think internal conversion is pretty is pretty central in Catholicism too. So that okay. line did not make a ton of sense to me as like, I, I, unless you're in like a very, very uh, old school, like school, neo-scholastic sort of setting, which I would it'd be a little hard to find where it's like the idea of everything in the sacraments is really mechanistic. And like, I, there's a lot of conversation in Catholicism about personal piety and devotion mm -hmm. and stuff. And, uh, okay. not, again, I'm not saying it's all good. It's a lot of it's really conservative and cloying and, not and, and problematic but yeah that that didn't really i don't know what that was about that was weird the editor the person who wrote that it's an editor at first things which is not a, a magazine that it's like a very conservative reactionary uh publication so i yeah, i don't I okay a lot of it okay good to know i yeah. uh, i i thought it was an interesting note so i wanted to yeah to, to ask deeper on it well, we are, uh, uh, and and finally, what uh, what I'll say on this topic, uh, Grandpa Chester, is uh, don't worry about it because it's going to be gone in a year. So, and uh, <laughs> I guess actually, my final comment on it is: look, if you if you want to, you know, uh, have some nice aesthetics and do some angel dust and uh, no, it's ketamine. Do some ketamine, ketamine to talk about theology. Ketamine. You know, let's let's <laughs> do it, right? We we can have I you know find me in Montreal. I can you know we have nice aesthetics. Um, I've never done ketamine, but you know, let's let's try it out, and uh, and we'll talk about we'll talk theology. You have to become um, our highest Patreon donor for that to happen. Yes, that's right. That's yeah. finally we that's figured it yeah, out. Ketamine's really we figured it out. Ketamine yeah. gets you through the high toll booth. You know, you got to yeah. <laughs> the <cable. laughs> Okay, we we are past an hour. Maybe we should wrap it up with, with one more. Well, past an hour. Maybe uh, one last question. Uh, what advice would you give to Gnostics who are not near any Gnostic churches or communities? Would you have any recommendations for solo practitioners or study? And that is from Orcloud. Anybody got anything on that one? Hmm. I think like there's probably some really clear directions that, <laughs> that Tim and John can talk about. Um, so maybe I'll. I, I've got thoughts, but I want to kind of I want to let them let you guys set the stage if you're interested first, or Nick for that matter. Yeah, I, I'll go. You know, I I say do some kind of spiritual practice and uh, read Gnostic texts, and uh, you can start your own community. Maybe you know the, you can start as a book club. It doesn't have to be a church. Um, so yeah, start start a Gnostic book club, and, and suddenly you have community. The other thing, as well as is talking about community, it is good to do religion of other people. So if, if there's not a Gnostic church by you, and chances are there there isn't, <laughs> um, then uh, I don't know. Go to the Unitarians. Go to an accepting uh, Episcopal or, or Anglican church. Go to um, uh, the Steiner Christian community. Um, chances are there's not a Gnostic church, it won't be one of those either. But you know, you can uh, you, you never can go know that and, and do your Gnosticism on the side, right? And uh, that's that's my advice. Um, uh, yeah. do, go ahead. But, well, I was gonna say, I, I was gonna say a similar thing that yeah, I'm only saying this as a suggestion because I've periodically succeeded and failed at this in my own life, which is that <laughs> you know, a lot of mainline Christian communities these days, especially kind of Protestant mainline, so 
like the United Church of Christ, like uh, Unitarian churches, a lot of them are really open to reading Gnostic texts at this point. Yeah. So, you know, I would mention earlier today, because I was rereading it, the A New New Testament, which came out of kind of mainline Protestant circles, publishing the New Testament alongside Gnostic texts. I mean, uh, and having gone to a kind of mainline liberal seminary, you know, reading non-canonical texts is now a thing that, like, that's being done, like, officially. So I think that, you know, you don't, I think it's a healthy thing to maybe, you don't have to join those churches, but to be in community with people at least a little bit, because I think one of the dangers, like we've been saying, with people kind of drawn to esoteric and Gnostic sort of stuff is the idea that you're kind of uh, on a separate level and uh, uh, like uh, apart from the rest of the normal mm. society in a way, which and understandably mm -hmm. in some sense, but that, you know, it's a good skill to actually be around like average religious people and see how it works. I think it can be healthy. So, you know, I would say maybe do that. Yeah. And, and just so, uh, for example, of what Nick is talking about, we've had uh, the Reverend Sean Garan on the show and, and hope to have him back. And he is a United Church of Christ. So extremely liberal uh, denomination in the United Ch Church uh, in, the, in the United States. Uh, it's inconvenient <laughs> of the Church of Canada, which I grew up in. And he he does a lot of work on Gnosticism and with the Gnostic scriptures from the pulpit. Uh, you know, he preaches from them, he does book clubs from them, he explains them, he does exegesis on them, uh, he has his sermons on them, he has a podcast about it, and he's doing it completely within the confines of this extremely uh, mainstream uh, progressive church. So, yeah, the, the, that, that's an excellent point, Nick, and uh, uh, and chances are that there is a similar denomination to that in, in your, your neck of the woods. And the thing is, you know, if they're not doing anything with with non-canonical scriptures or gnostic scriptures chances are with, with these very open and, and, and liberal forms of christianity you can be the one to introduce people to them right particularly when you think of like some of the stuff about the divine feminine and some of the political stuff that that could be extracted from the text uh, maybe political is not the right word but you know what i mean the, 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 talking about power fits in quite well with the with, with the the liberal mainline tradition tim do you have anything on isolated gnostics um well the question my prejudice with that question is always to go well what should you do as spiritual practice if you're stuck on your own but that's not actually what the question is directly asking they're saying solo study they're not talking about practice so um the next the, the following question i think is about, <laughs> is about spiritual practice so i guess i could i could address it and have some uh, have some spill over to the next the next question or i guess but um in terms of solo study of the material, I, you know, uh, subscribe to Talk Gnosis on Patreon. Um, <laughs> seriously, I the um, I guess if you're if you're intrigued by the Gnostic material, and if you're intrigued by Gnosticism as a as a way of understanding spirituality, I guess I'd encourage you to to um, get to a point where you feel like you've got a handle on the material and then stop. Because mm. um, the National Mighty Library is very big. Um, it's, it's there's a lot of apparently incredibly detailed things you can spend, and scholars do spend their entire lives trying to work out what any of it might have meant, what the original authors could have intended. It's not gonna help. It's not going to get you anywhere. You can spend an infinite amount of time in online forums arguing with people about, you know, exactly which archon belongs in which aeon and the, 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 you know, I'm talking nonsense, but ticky tacky nerdy stuff. I mean, spend some time talking to Pokemon players or something instead. It's more fun. Um, I gather that <laughs> I gather that my little pony movement is quite welcoming. Just go do that. It's a, it's a better use of your time. Don't waste time trying to figure out the details of Gnostic scripture. That's not what they're for. Um, don't waste time trying to figure out the details of any scripture. It's not what it's for. What it's about is to provide a, a mirror to you of the realities of the reality in which you're living in and to challenge you to live life in a different way. So mm. to figure out at the moment at which you realize what it's challenging you to do right now, say, thanks very much, close the book and then get about it, yeah. mm -hmm. um, put it away. And then at some point later in a year or two years or something, you might find the need for that challenge again. So open it up again and find another challenge. To me, I'm, I'm impatient. <laughs> I'm, I'm impatient with a lot of this. I think, I think a lot of people in esotericism and Gnosticism uh, 
you've been duly warned. A lot of people in esotericism and Gnosticism spend a great deal of time fussing about the wrong things. Um, from my reading of the Gnostic material, and this is intensely uh, um, guided by my own experience and my own prejudices, and so that's what you're getting kind of unfiltered in this moment. Two things, we're told two things matter, right? One thing is that the human soul, as we come into adult life, is broken. We address life from brokenness. We are split into unintegrated parts, and those unintegrated parts are the agents of difficulty and, and in some cases, evil in our lives. So a fundamental responsibility we have to take on as adult human beings is to address that unintegrated nature in our own souls. Um, we say mind in the present day, they said souls in the old day, but it means the same thing. It's all psuche in Greek, so for nefesh in Hebrew, it's the same thing. So that's a long-winded way of saying do some shadow work. If you don't know what that means, look it up. Um, email one of us. <laughs> we'll send you some leads. Um, go back into old talk gnosis shows about the shadow, but do some shadow work. Address the places where you're emotionally reactive in relationship with other people. Look to the fundamental causes of that re reactivity and heal it. That's your first responsibility, I think. Mm. That's what the material is telling us. That's the whole story of the Demiurge and the Archons plays out organizationally in the ways that we've talked about before, and it plays out personally in the way your shadow manifests in your broken psyche as an adult. That's the first thing. The second thing, and this is really simple <laughs> and yet impossible, but the second thing is um, to, to come to know the unknown father. To come face to face with the reality of the monad is the underlying reality of, of all of existence. And that plays out on an individual level as the um, the immediate realization of the self, the fundamental ground of the self as consciousness itself. And that's it. Completely empty of content, radically free, ultimately creative. That's something we all nod to. It's something all esoteric material points at. The only thing that will, well, there is a whole bunch of practices that will get you there. I commend the work of Jeffrey Martin in the book Finders, which paints a picture of various different practice techniques that will get you there. Um, for some people, just hearing that that's possible. Some people mm. may have gotten into fundamental consciousness in that moment in me saying it. I don't know. Good luck if you did. Congratulations. Um, <laughs> Please don't drive while watching the show. <laughs> don't drive while watching the show. But that's it. That's it. Yeah. That's what you've got to do. And those two things. So shadow work is personal work done in the context of relationship, because if you're not getting triggered by other people, you can't see your own shadow. The way you see your shadow is your emotional reactivity to what other people are doing. So it has to be found in relationship and worked on privately with a therapist. If that's appropriate on your own, there's a whole bunch of uh, approaches to shadow practice you can do solo. You don't need to pay for a therapist necessarily unless it's extremely deep material and you need someone else to kind of hold you and keep you safe as you're working on it um, and that can be very helpful um, but awakening is fundamental consciousness attaining uh, what martin calls fundamental well-being or <laughs> the much nerdier persistent non-symbolic experience um, uh, that's that's just you that's just you you pick a path of practice, do it. And uh, one thing Martin finds in his research, and I think this is really powerful and important, is that it should be quick. If it doesn't happen within a couple of years, it's not going to happen with that technique and you need to find a different technique. Mm. So, most people that take up a path of practice, if it's going to happen, it happens six months to a year. And if it doesn't, stop doing that, find something else. Don't let anyone tell you to stick with a path of practice for decades. What that means is that path of practice is probably not for you. Yeah, that's that's, that's such a powerful point, and it, it's been so liberating uh, for me, Tim, to, to understand that and, and just to see you know, because uh, I, I do teach a, a, a secular meditation, right? And and just from the practice of doing that and seeing how some techniques uh, just click with people with, with the way that their brains are structured and and seeing them to quote unquote make progress. I don't like talking about progress. And then the same thing with myself, right? Uh, sometimes changing tracks, um, sticking with, with a practice for a little while. You know what I would say, and this is not 
you know, maybe not what Tim would say is, is you do want to give it an honest attempt, right? Mm-hmm. So because there is always the temptation to jump around, uh, particularly if uh, in in Western esotericism, right? The, the next big shiny thing. Uh, and I've definitely been guilty of that and I'll continue to be guilty of it. So, you, you know, you, you do need that middle path of I'm going to give this the old college try. I'm going to be dedicated to it. Okay, this one, I, I gave it the try. It's it's not working. I'm going to try something else, right? So without uh, without sticking to something that isn't going to work for decades, but not jumping around all sorts of things. And, 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 something... and, a, okay. and a good try, I'd say a good try is sort of three to six months. Yeah. If you can't, if you can't notice the beginnings of something shifting within about three months and definitely within six months, that's enough of a try, right? Trying something for a couple of weeks or a couple of months is probably not enough, but three to six months, there ought to be noticeable differences. And, and for noticeable differences, it can be it can be easy to get on your own your uh, high high on on your own supply. And um, <laughs> the, you know it is funny. It's um, every time I felt like, you know, I know disasters around the corner when I feel like I have my shit together, right? Uh, and you know, I remember feeling, oh man, I I'm I'm so I've got this, I've got it, right? I've got it. And then you know, life kicks you in the head, and you realize you don't got it. Um, so that's that's also something important to, re- to remember. And, and building on what Tim was saying, I, I do like this this this, this three to six months. Um, and uh, and you're not saying Tim that the people are going to get enlightened in six months, right? But that you should be able to see some changes. Um, it, ha- it it happens. That, I mean yes. that that shift that first shift into fundamental well being, which is characterized by a, uh, dropping out of adverse emotional states in in daily life, um, a fundamental cessation of fear. Um, Martin, you know, makes the analogy to the to the phrase that we're all familiar with, the peace which passeth all understanding. So, so regardless of what thought is doing, there's a fundamental peacefulness surrounding each moment. Um, right. And that can happen within a very short period of time. Yeah. Um, but it may not, and it may take a few months or a year or so. So yeah. no. um, I'm, sorry, I'm saying three to six months to notice whether anything's, whether you're noticing the beginning of that beginning to occur and something you could you could sink into and turn do more deeply sorry I, I didn't want to digress from what you were saying but i just want to be clear no i um uh, well and i think something that just, like I, just personally like so i uh, uh i've said like earlier today and i said before on the show like I, you know that i'm not very christian or very like distinctly religious but one thing that's so i encountered Gnosticism. I, many people have heard this already but i encountered it through Dungeons and Dragons, and then proceeded to become super interested in in all of the stuff. Like um, uh, Houston Smith had a great lecture that like really lit me up, and and I still listen to occasionally. Um, the pathway from it turns out Dungeons and Dragons is a gateway drug for Houston Smith. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> of whom neither of that neither of whom expected that. Um, uh, what was I going? Oh, um, but then I encountered the AJC as probably the most level-headed group of Gnostics that I could find. And also, randomly, one of them uh, happened to live in the same city as me. <laughs> um, so uh, so I, I was like, okay, well, this is my community. But the AJC mostly, not entirely, but mostly is pretty Christian and fairly churchy. <laughs> and uh, so for a long time, I would be like reading the Reddit or uh, the, the Facebook comments and, and like clicking on the articles and trying to like completely understand every detail that they were talking about regarding some translation of the Bible or a particular interpretation of the Trinity or what have you. And it took me a long time. Like, I wish I'd, I wish I'd uh, had that three to six month advice where I could like, not, it, not, not to say that I've left the church, but that I, that I left aside feeling like I had to subscribe to this interpretation, this one way or this, this not, not one way, but this communal way that a lot of the members of the AJC enjoy. Um, by letting that go, I then was able to appreciate so much more of what the community was offering because I wasn't frustrated by my lack of engagement, my lack of like excitement in the stuff that, that was being talked about. Because then I was going, then I was just hearing the stuff I was excited by. And this gets to my my answer or my 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 elements of the answer is that for solo study, pay attention to the to the things you are excited by, to those things that do light you up. Um, not necessarily your own supply, try to make sure that it is someone else's supply of ideas or at least some, a, community's, uh, a community that you can engage with. Um, and then to continue to go further with, with like 
when, when you're sort of following that that trail of ideas or that that trail of of aesthetics that that are uh, that are really captivating you um and uh and then the only other thing and i've said this said this uh, a couple of times in various versions on this sh this episode is that beware anybody who is telling you that there's only one true version of any idea or book or mythology or cosmology or anything like that if anybody is, is trying to tell you that there's a there's one truth and that they have it and they want you to subscribe to their patreon or buy their book or whatever then then i would so strongly suggest to keep moving so like uh to, to even if you're like but i'm still fascinated by, by that particular subject i'm like well that person is probably getting it from a book or a school of thought that you can find on Wikipedia or what have you, um, and like, feel free to join the join a subreddit about it. Feel free to debate online or on Twitter about it. Well, maybe not Twitter, but <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, avoid anybody who's trying to tell you that they've got a truth. Yeah, uh, I, I guess I'll I'll just add to uh, uh, what you're both saying, uh, uh, Tim and Jason, which is, you know, the, the audience, take me as a cautionary tale, right? Don't give yourself <laughs> brain worms because I have given myself Gnostic brain worms and I can fixate. Uh, I don't think I'm on the autism spectrum, but sometimes I wonder when I do sit down to read a text about Gnosticism, right? Because, you know, the, there's, there's mysteries in there. There's things to discover and uh, not just in the ancient text, going right up to the modern day. So, oh man, what does that word mean? And if you heard of this obscure lineage and did you know about this spin-off from this spin-off of this spin-off group and all three people who are currently joining me uh, are, uh, have experienced this <laughs> and are perhaps in group chats with me where i'm like what do you think about this theory what do you think about this word it, you know, I, I think that's stuff I, obviously I, I do think that stuff is fun um, I, I think it can have some importance. It can lead to somewhere sometimes. But but Tim is absolutely right, and Jason as well, that that is not the point, right? You you, you know, maybe I'd be better off playing Pokemon. Um, and, and, and Jason, I think it is, um, I don't want to say common, it, it is a critique that has been leveled at the AJC, right? That people show up. And then they, they don't know what's going on because, you know, they do know about Gnosis and they've read some Gnostic texts and people are just chattering away about, uh, about this, uh, at the end of the day, obscure minutia, right? And, and people feel isolated from that. Well, um, and, yeah. and they're right. So <laughs> I mean, something positive, though, about, about please, that. Please. Yeah. So I should say that because so John knows this, but I'm actually uh, in, well, it's in talks, but I'm, I'm actually thinking about joining AJC more formally. Mm. Um, and I would say that. Although on the one hand, that would make sort of, when I said earlier that like my advice of go to a mainline church to be in community, I'm not doing a good job at that. It's partially, I mean, on the other hand, I kind of think that my reason for joining is, and what I really love about AJC, so I'll give a plug because I'm not officially a member, is that actually I have found real community with AJC folks and in this this group. So, and so for me, it's actually, I, I'm thinking of it as more being more mature and saying like, what are the places where I'm actually in community? I should be part of that and not create some sort of theoretical reason why I need to, you know, maintain, like, I'm not going to make the Pope into an esotericist or something. So, <laughs> you know, because as I've said earlier, I'm, I've been more, uh, I've been in the Catholic Church for a long time. So, like, that, I, I think that you can get that kind of community in AJC and other groups like it. But I do think that, like Jason's saying, you know, it's not all the stuff about, like, the Gnostic words and, you know, etymology and stuff to me hasn't been the part that I, I like all that stuff, but it's been being around actual people who are interested in things. And, you know, so that, that's yeah. there. I mean, yeah. part of what kept me here is the, is the fact that here, I shouldn't say here, uh, but it kept me in the, in here in the Gnostic, like overall community that led me to being on the show, but like in the AJC is that for all of the minutia, nobody was telling me what to believe. Nobody was telling me that there was only one thing to do which would have sent me running. Um, so I, I just back you up, Nick. It's it's a really good community. And maybe in case anybody's listening to this for the first time and the, the, their first episode, the AJC is the Apostolic Joannite Church, just so you can have something to Google other than AJC. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I would just add too, and, and of course, you know, as I said, that that is a criticism, but it doesn't mean that the AJC doesn't rule. And you know, I have a relatively small community here in, in Montreal, as many of us do. You know, we, we have three to five regulars, and then, uh, but sometimes we can get anywhere from you know twenty people in the room, right? A lot of looksies, and and those regulars um, are very good at calling me on my BS and not letting me blab about minutia. 
right? Because they are there for the things that Jason and Nick are talking about. And I and I think they're getting them. Maybe not necessarily from me. I'm not the deliverer of those things. They're getting them from each other. We're all getting them together. But uh, hopefully, as Tim was saying, uh, this little parish doesn't turn into some sort of raging archon. Um, <laughs> Okay. Uh, okay, we're at an hour and thirty-eight minutes. Uh, Tim, <laughs> do we want to tackle that next question about spiritual practice? Because I know you were sort of. Oh, you wanted well, to get to it. Of, I've sort of said what I would say. Really, oh, uh, okay. do you want to read it out? Maybe. Yeah, let's let's read it out. So it's from uh, Santa Selva. I'm always kind of curious how different Gnostics incorporate practice into their daily lives. Contemplations of texts, meditation, praying, or ritual. I know many Gnostics who practice contemplation. I wonder if there's others out there who practice going inward of meditation. Do some try to use rituals found in texts like the Book of Zhu? That's J-E-U. So uh, the answer to all that is yes. Yeah. Um, yes. A, a lot of the times, uh, meditation and forms of, of contemplation are, are very big among among many Gnostics and many Gnostic practitioners. Mm -hmm. um, there are Gnostics out there that, that uh, do um, recreate rituals um, from Gnostic texts, like the Book of Jew, which seems to have, you know, one of the clearest layings out of, of ritual work, I believe, right? Um, and if not, if they don't actually have um, some structure for ritual, then, then incorporating ancient Gnostic texts into some kind of ritual, if that makes sense. So, uh, yeah, um, that's that's uh, uh, praying, uh, uh, contemplation of texts, uh, ritual. Uh, Gnostics do all those things. Now I know that this isn't necessarily a helpful answer because it's like, what 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 kinds of those things, right? But a lot of the times it is it is sort of um, a, a Gnostic take on on a lot of uh, Christian practices. So um, or not even a Gnostic take. So something like centering prayer, which is basically a form of Christian meditation, uh, mass, um, uh, the daily office. Um, um, the, uh, 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 the, um, the, the many, uh, Jesuit practices, uh, those are, those are all, uh, done, uh, kind of Buddhist style meditation is, is also quite common. And, and, and sometimes, you know, there, there is kind of a problem where, where you can just take something out of a Christian context and wave a wand over it. We call it the, the Gnostic wand, right? And then you, you swap out a couple of words and all of a sudden you have a Gnostic practice. And, and you, I think you do have to be careful. <laughs> you have to be careful with that. But at the same time, you know, uh, if you're talking about most Gnostics, most Gnostic organizations, they are Christian, right? And Gnosticism is an important part of the Christian heritage. It is, even in mainline, mainstream uh, Christianity, there is Gnosticism around the edges of it. It's, it's in the Bible, right? It's in the Gospel of John, which is a proto-Gnostic text. It's in Paul. So, so that means that, that we can recreate, I, I think, some practices, uh, and we can wave the Gnostic wand over, over some things. No, we do have to be careful, right? Just like everything. Uh, I'm always putting asterisks on, on, on everything I say. Um, yeah. Does anybody else got, got anything on that one? A couple of things. I quickly. Betcha. Um, people, yeah, you, your actual question is what do other Gnostics do? And John has answered that very articulately and well, and I'd agree with everything that he said. Um, obviously, uh, me being me, my, um, you want, you want to, oh, yeah, well, let's see. Sorry, I didn't have it loaded up. Uh, 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 <laughs> there we go. Um, Remember, if you have any problems with anything that Tim says, email Jason <laughs> at gnosticwisdom.net. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> anything at all, any problem that you have, anything Tim said, immediately fired off to there. Gnostics will do a great many things. And um, and if you look at the, at the, the kinds of things Gnostics do in general and, and people in Gnostic churches do in general, they'll do a great many things. And my concern is always what actually matters and what should you spend your time on. Time is limited. This, this human life that we have is limited. If you actually, it depends. It actually, honestly, it actually depends. A great many people are involved in this kind of stuff because they're looking for other, it's cool and it's in, it's intellectually intriguing and they're looking for other people to hang out with. They'll also find it cool and intellectually intriguing. Um, and you might identify as a spiritual person or as a Gnostic and you're looking for a place to put that feeling of identity in community so it has a greater sense of, of connection and groundedness. And if that's your bag, fantastic. Just go do anything you want, it doesn't matter. Because really, all that matters is that you're finding connection with other people and that you're able to talk about some cool ideas. My exclusive focus in this stuff is the transformative potential of spirituality and its ability to fundamentally undo the dilemma of being a human being and divinize. That's what I care about. 
I don't give a toss. <laughs> Community is important as a container, but that's it. So I've already said what I think the two most important things are. What I think you should probably spend a great deal less time on than many people do is all the many practices which will make you feel nice but won't actually do anything. And that is most ritual work. Most ritual work is going to make you feel nice and it may create some incremental changes. I'm not saying they're not helpful. I'm saying in terms of bang for buck in the amount of transformation you'll experience in the time you've got available to you, it's not a good way to spend your time. Um, if you have a problem with that, please email Jason at nostywisdom.net. Um, <laughs> I probably openly have a problem with that. That's fine. I don't mind. Um, I do kind of almost an apparent contradiction to that. The Eucharist specifically, <laughs> the Eucharist specifically is, plays a pivotal role in Christian mysticism. Um, because it's the single place where you come into direct unmediated encounter with the divine. And so if you're practicing a Christian form of meditation like pairing prayer or Christian meditation or classic contemplation, the necessary pairing with that is to place your tuned human heart into the context of the Eucharist on the regular, not necessarily every week, but multiple times a year, and to allow that to do its work because it's the practice of contemplation in the context of the Eucharist that does it. And the, the mystical saints, Julian of Norwich, Hildegard, Teresa, John of the Cross are unanimous on that's, that is how the system works. So like, I'm going to be a little cheeky, like doing contemplation <laughs> without the Eucharist or doing, or doing Eucharist without contemplation is as pointless as pursuing shamatha meditation without doing Vipassana or doing Vipassana without pursuing shamatha in Buddhism, because the two of them go together. Um, I, I say that with an awareness that many people who practice mindfulness meditation are really only doing shamatha, but a rascal bishop. Yep. So you get what you pay for. <laughs> exactly, which is a dollar. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, cost famous, I cost the same as corn. Yes. Right. <laughs> yeah, well, for now, I don't know if you've seen food prices, uh, Bishop Tim. Uh, Wait, no, did you mean corn the band? <laughs> as much as a corn <laughs> At a flea market or yard sale. <laughs> that was a very that was a very tricksy answer. I totally agree with you theologically, but it was very <laughs> tricksy to, yeah. yeah, the Eucharist and the yeah. Well, the, I, I guess I guess to unknot the potential trickiness, Nick. If you're not if you're not practicing contemplation and you're just attending the Eucharist and it's just yeah. making you feel it's nice, just community where you go to coffee hour, you talk to people, it doesn't seep into any type of part of yourself. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So two things together that do the work. Mm -hmm. There's a there's a challenge to the Eucharist that uh, you know that you sort of have to like if you're if you're paying attention to it you have to engage with like um, uh, like I think like any great work of art like you have to engage with uh, the experience that it, that it's giving you otherwise you're not you know you're looking at your phone while you're watching the movie or or whatever um, uh, one one thing I uh, uh, one practice that I've been really engaging with lately. Uh, for myself is uh, is journaling actually journaling a lot around um, that both from a probably semi therapeutic uh, benefit like I've been doing a lot of cognitive behavioral therapy journaling where you really like look at a thought and then discuss the thought with yourself like is this true how do I know this is true that kind of thing um, but then also applying that or or taking that level of analysis to gnostic ideas like why do I think that archons are true, or why do why do archons appeal to me? Why do demiurges appeal to me? Why does this particular version of a text appeal to me? Uh, like discuss with yourself on the page uh, will be, I think, a really interesting way um, that I haven't heard people talk about a lot that I've been finding really valuable lately. Yeah, well, it was just like uh, what, what both Jason and Tim are are saying, right? Like it's. We live in a modern world, so we can take advantage of, of, of what's available for us, right? And different psychological practices and, and therapy, I think, um, are, are, are quite important if you're going to do spiritual out. Um, so, you know, uh, the famously, uh, 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 who was it who said, you know, you had to do like a year of psychoanalysis before joining the Golden Dawn, right? Uh, Israel like, Regardi. Uh, yeah. 
yeah, thank you. It is real regarding. So, uh, I, I, you know, I, I'm not saying that this this will get you there if you just go to therapy, but you know, you, you do you do want to unfuck yourself a little bit, right? And um, and of course, uh, I think uh, the people who watch the show knows that that my bias would would be to towards uh, psychoanalysis and at least some form of of the famous talking cure because I, I think that the the free association verbal method is is one of the the best ways to um, to uh, unfuck yourself, uh, but it may not be the best thing, you know, it, it, I, I, as a long-term project, right? Uh, <laughs> it may not always be the, the best thing if you are having a psychological crisis or you are tackling a very specific issue in your life, right? Uh, or uh, certain other uh, psychological conditions. But for, for that, 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 that lifelong work of unfucking yourself, um, I, I think that that is, that is a, a great tool in the toolbox that perhaps uh, you should be doing as well as, as spiritual work. Or of course, you know, CBT and, and other forms of, of therapy. So don't, you know, it's, it, we live in the modern world, uh, you know, we, we can take advantage of it. All right. So I, uh, an hour and 49 minutes. I, I think that's probably a good place to wrap up. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, this folks, might be a two-parter. <laughs> yeah, it might be a two-parter. Uh, uh, folks, it's, it's, it's been a, a lot of fun as usual. Uh, I hope that we will see you all back here on the show soon. And for all those out there listening and watching, uh, please uh, send in your questions for, for future shows. You can uh, just email uh, Jonathan at gnosticwisdom.net or leave them on our Facebook page or Twitter or uh, on uh, in the comments uh, section below on YouTube. Uh, just, uh, the, you know, write them, write your questions on a piece of paper, or tie them to a pigeon, you know, push a pigeon out a window, it, it, it'll get to us. Um, Tim, where can people <laughs> find you online? Uh, TimMansfield.com, which I'm currently updating as we're talking so that it has some way to contact me, in fact, afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> I realized you didn't. Um, and I'm saying that, I'm saying that because I've, I, I realized I've just dumped a whole bunch of, like, intriguing leads and yes. things if any of that kind of fires off anything anybody wants to follow up on really happy to chat or talk to people you can find me on twitter at tim j mansfield um it's my twitter handle uh i'm on facebook and and but just go to the website and um there's a <laughs> there's a slightly obscure email address if i have time i'll turn it into a contact form but anyway get in touch get in touch happy to talk always happy to chat to people who are trying to do the work awesome uh nick where can people find you online um, so yeah, my personal blog is the light So yeah, you can contact me there through a contact form too. And then since Tim mentioned Twitter, I'll mention Twitter that I am on Twitter and, but I try not to use it that much anymore, but at, at NJ Lachetti, um, is my Twitter. I I'm on Twitter, but I'm not going to tell anybody. I, I know you all know my address. Uh, I, well, I'm on there way too much, but I, you know, I mostly just retweet. So, and then occasionally a, a dumb joke that someone will DM me with anger about. Um, okay, uh, Jason, where can people find you online? Uh, you've already put it up on the screen there, jasonmemmel.com. I think it's actually my Twitter and Instagram are both you know, links there. Even uh, I think so. there might be a widget that's broke, but the, the click will take you at the same place anyway. So, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, and it'll lead to anything else that I'm doing. Very, very cool. And uh, for me, uh, holygrail.substack.com is my HAC community in Montreal. So if you are in Montreal, come on out. Uh, we have our venue is um, under renovation. Uh, we have been doing mostly things online and in parks due to COVID. And now this is uh, happening. So there's a good chance that you can join us online if you want to check it out. So go to holygrail.substack.com. Uh, also, as I mentioned, uh, I do work part time as a uh, meditation and mindfulness coach and a mindfulness based stress reduction facilitator. Uh, I have training in that regard and uh, I do free meditation every Sunday at 11 a.m. Uh, open to everyone. It's uh, it's secular. It's great for Gnostics. It's great for non Gnostics. Come bring your your stressed out grandma. Uh, Mildendsmeditation.substack.com. It's mildendsmeditation.substack.com. It's free. Uh, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. 11 a.m. Montreal time. All right, everybody. Thanks so much, and uh, we'll catch you on the flip side. Bye. 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 Bye.